Welcome to the September 25th, 2024 Wednesday Bible Study. I'm glad you're here. You might want to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. We have a few verses to consider today as we continue our study in this great epistle from the beloved Apostle John. As you're opening up your Bible, let me invite you to our in-person Wednesday Bible Study. Every single Wednesday at 7 p.m., we do come together for a in-person Wednesday Bible study. It's a time in which we are able to sing together, pray together, open up God's Word for discussion. In our in-person Wednesday Bible study, we're actually examining the book of 1 Peter, a book that gives us great encouragement. It, it stimulates patience through difficult or trying times, as well as giving us hope for the future. And we're in chapter 1 of 1 Peter right now in that in-person Wednesday Bible study. So we'd love to have you come and be with us for that. Every Lord's Day, each Sunday, we meet together for a Bible study at 10 a.m., for a period of worship at 11 a.m., and then most Sunday evenings, it's 6 p.m. for our evening, Bible stu evening worship, I should say, a period of evening worship. However, on the last Sunday of each month, like this one coming, the 29th of September, we'll meet at 2 p.m. Because we Every, every uh, last Sunday of the month, we gather together after the morning worship for a meal together, and then we embark on our evening worship at 2 p.m. We'd love to have you come and be with us for any of those occasions, all of those occasions. The Sunday services are generally live-streamed as long as I'm here doing the, the preaching, or as long as I'm here, we might say. And so I'd love to have you come and be with us. We at Union Hill would make you an honored guest. If you would come and, and be with us for any of those occasions, maybe you're in the area, you live in this particular community or this particular area, we'd love to have you come and, and be with us for those worship assemblies, or maybe you're just passing through. There is a lot of traffic that goes back and forth from the uh, Destin, Fort Walton Beach areas, and we'd love to have you come and, and be with us if you happen to be passing through on vacation. Now let's get to 1 John chapter 5. Last week in our Wednesday Bible study, we exposed, gave exposition to chapter 5 and verse 13, but then also developed it further in an understanding of the things John wrote. Because remember, he said, these things write we unto you that you may know that you have eternal life and that believing in the Son, uh, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So two things he said, I'm writing these for. Now, in chapter 1, in verse number 4, he said he was writing that their joy may be full, and nothing could give us that overall contentment, that great joy, uh, as he talked about, more so than knowing that we are right with God and that our eternal destiny is going to be in heaven with him. So we broke down that verse and, and looked at how can we know, how can we really know that we have eternal life? or that we're living in view of the fulfillment of that promise God has made of life with him in heaven. And John has given us several things within the book. Now, this week as we continue on in that confidence, as he's given them knowledge as to how to know how that confidence is gained, he'll go on to say that with this confidence, not only do we project toward the future, not only do we focus on eternal life, but there's actually a benefit to this knowledge here. Knowing that we're right with God, knowing that eternal life is what awaits us in the future, there is a present blessing as it pertains to prayer. He says in verse number 14 of 1 John 5, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So John tells us that with that confidence, knowing that eternal life is ours to be gained, that it's a promise of, of definite fulfillment from God, we can know that we're bound for the promised land. We know that we're headed for spiritual Canaan in heaven eternal with God we then know that we have a God who will hear us now as we sojourn here, as we're treading a course, passing our time here. I think that's the way Peter said it in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17. If we call him Father, or since we call him Father, we then need to pass the time of our sojourning in fear. 
Well, we can pass the time of our sojourning here with knowledge of the future hope of heaven, knowing that currently God is willing to hear. So obviously he's talking about prayer there and the confidence that we can have in communicating with our Heavenly Father. Now, here's what we need to know. It goes along with that confidence. That confidence does not belong to the one who does not have eternal life. That confidence doesn't belong to the one who does not know Jesus. That confidence doesn't belong to the individual who is not obeying Jesus and following his example, if you remember or recall the things that we spoke about last week. This confidence that we have of God hearing us in prayer is linked with or connected to the confidence that we have in, in eternal life. Knowing that we've done and are continuing to do what is essential to gain eternal life, we know that God will hear. Unfortunately, there are far too many people in this world that don't understand what the Bible actually presents about prayer. There are a lot of praying people, people who seek to petition God in prayer or who are requesting that prayers be made and others that will respond praying for you without understanding God's not listening, God's not hearing their prayer. So notice here in this verse, he says that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. His will is paramount to whether or not God hears our prayer. We have to ask according to his will. So if, if we don't ask according to his will, or if we're not in the position where we're keeping his will and attentive to his will, then he's not going to hear. I, I want you to think about a couple passages of scripture that reinforce that thought of being in the right condition for God to hear our prayers. In John chapter 9, Jesus healed a man that had been born blind. And for all of his life, he'd never been able to see, but Jesus heals him. Well, that, that actually drums up a, a controversy with the Jewish leaders. Because when this man is healed of his eyesight, notice that Jesus, after having healed him at the pool of Siloam in verse number 7, uh, the, the Pool of Siloam is mentioned, um, Jesus is, is actually going to send him on his way. And uh, the question is going to be, who healed you? And he's going to, to, of course, reference Jesus. And then again, the Pharisees ask him how he received his sight in verse 15. And he said unto them, he put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed and do see. And, and this is a problem for the Pharisees who are trying to undermine Jesus. They don't want this recognition going to Jesus as one who works miracles. And so they tell him that Jesus is not of God. I want you to notice what this blind man says in response to those Jewish religious leaders. In verse number 31, he says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Now they were trying to tell him that Jesus was not of God, but this man knew enough of God's word, subsequent knowledge of the Old Testament and what God had revealed about hearing prayers to know that God only hears those that worship him. God only hears those that are right with him. If a man is a sinner, if a man is an individual who is practicing sin, who is not of God, God's not going to hear him. And that man knew that, and thus he concluded that Jesus must be of God because God had heard him. Now, we could also look at 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse number 12, he says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. So he, he gives us the group of which he's talking about, the righteous. And he says, the eyes of the Lord are over them. He's watching the righteous as though guarding their way, paying attention to their course, concerned about 
what's going on with them. And his ears, not only are his eyes upon them, but his ears are open unto their prayers. He's going to hear when they petition him. Now, in contrast, notice in verse 12 of 1 Peter 3, he says, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. That's a contrast. So if, if he says the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, the contrast would be while the Lord's face is against them that do evil, his eyes aren't over them. He's not approving of them. He's not guarding them, protecting them. He's not as concerned with them as he is the righteous. And his ears then are not open to their prayers. We generally look at those in which we're interested. Our ears pay attention to what is being said. So if someone is talking to us, if someone is communicating with us, we look at them. We face them. If we turn our back to them, it is a sign of, of disinterest or a sign of disrespect or it is a sign of, of not paying attention. So if the face of the Lord is against those that do iniquity or those that do evil, well, that means he's not approving of their way and he's not hearing their prayer because that's what he does with the righteous. And in contrast with the, those that do evil, he's not doing that. So we do recognize that we must be right with God. So when we know we have eternal life, we know that we're right with God. We've done the things that God has told us to do. We've become pure as he is pure. We're obeying his commandments. We're keeping his word. We're in Christ. We are keeping his commandments, obeying him. All of those things we talked about last week and because we know we're right with God, we know we're righteous, we know that God is going to hear our petitions. He's going to hear our prayers. Now, he goes on to say, we know that not only does God hear them, not only do they fall upon his ears, but he also says, if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. We also know then that God is going to answer those prayers. We recognize that if God is going to hear us, we have confidence that God will hear. That also breeds confidence that God is going to respond. God is going to answer those prayers. Now, the, the thing about answering prayer, God always answers the prayer of the righteous. Now, sometimes the righteous man may seem to think that God didn't hear or that God didn't answer because the answer is not forthcoming in the, the way that the righteous man praying may have thought that it should be. Remember, we're asking all things according to his will and that his will be done in all things. And we don't always know if our desires of, of that moment in that prayer offered actually coincide with his will? Uh, are they in harmony with his will when it comes to the things for which we pray? And it may not always be that way. So God may answer the prayer in a way that we didn't anticipate or we didn't want, but he still answered the prayer to our good and what was for our good. So when we recognize how God answers prayer, we, we can have confidence that God is always answering our prayer and he answers that prayer knowing what is best for us or what is in our best interest. And it may be that sometimes the overall best interest that we think is not what is in the best interest. And there may be uh, within the will of God the the understanding of what's better. Um, there are general principles, but not every detail do we recognize and understand. So when we pray, we pray knowing God will answer, but that he will answer according to his will. And in his infinite knowledge, in his infinite wisdom, he is going to answer our prayer. Um, we are to ask him in faith. 
And we are to expect confidently that God is going to answer uh, for that which is in our good. And it may be that it, it's an answer in his time and not ours. So there's a lot of factors here to answer. Sometimes people will say this, God answers our prayer in perhaps three ways. Maybe he answers our petition, yes. The very thing for which we are asking, he says absolutely. Yes, there may be occasions where God's will isn't so uh, in line with ours or ours isn't so in line with his, and he says no. But that's still an answer to the prayer. And there are occasions dealing with his timetable that he may say in answer to our prayer, maybe later. So generally, and I've heard it from the time I was a child, the concept that God will answer prayer yes, he can answer prayer no, and he can answer prayer maybe later or at a later time. And we need to have confidence, one, that God will answer, but two, in that answer, it's going to be according to his will in his infinite knowledge, in his infinite power, and on his timetable. So, we have this great confidence knowing that our Heavenly Father desires to hear from us and we can petition Him and know that our prayers will be answered. Now, in verse 16 and 17, we have another topic, but it pertains to prayer because He's just talked about our petitions being heard. But of course, at the end of verse number 16, He says, I do not say He shall pray for it. Of course, what is the it here? We'll, we'll explain that. But still, verse 16 and 17 then are going to be connected to this idea of confidence in prayer. And it's going to pertain to one specific thing for which we need to incorporate or include in our prayer life. So notice in verse 16, he says, If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, and I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So this matter of prayer is going to pertain to sin being committed. Now, two or three aspects here. Number one, I want you to notice what John said about who is committing the sin. He says, if any man see his brother sin a sin. So in this case, where we're looking at the, the uh, guilty, we're actually looking at Christians. We're looking at those who are part of God's family. We're looking at those who are in Christ. We are looking at those who are part of the church. We are looking at those who had entered into a saved condition from their past sins, having obeyed the gospel. You know, I, in, in other places within the book, we have talked about this matter that a Christian can actually sow sin so as to be lost. And there have been in, in comments made to those videos and, and even at other times in, in my teaching and preaching where Individuals have taken exception to that. They believe that they're once saved, always saved. And yet John says here that a brother can sin after he's entered the family of God. Once he's entered into that saved condition and sin can be committed, and notice there he, he says that a brother can sin a sin that is not unto death and a sin that is unto death. As it pertains to the sin unto death, he, he says you can pray for that, and that's evidenced by the fact that he says the sin un, that is unto death, don't pray for that. So a brother can sin. We need to etch that in our minds. We can so sin so as to be lost, and the evidence of Scripture is overwhelming presenting that truth. You may not believe it, but that would mean you're not believing what the Bible said. Because John said, as an inspired writer, a disciple, an apostle of Jesus, that we can see a brother sin a sin 
that is not unto death, and we can see a brother sin a sin that is unto death. And so first, uh, out of this set of scripture, as it regards that for which we are to pray, notice that a brother can sin. All right? Number two, what do we mean by this sin unto death and sin not unto death? Now, death, of course, is the key word here because it is what's qualifying the sin that has been committed by the brother, a sin that is unto death versus a sin not unto death. Death being the key word in, in the uh, text or in, in the passage, you need to understand that if something is unto death, it is something that is fatal. It is something that is mortal. It is something that is deadly. Now, we're not, we're not talking about physical death here. We're not talking about the idea that someone is so sinned or uh, committed an act that leads to his physical demise. It is possible to sin in that way. There are some things that, that can uh, bring about your death either in quick fashion or even in slow fashion. But what he is talking about here is not in the sense of physical demise. He's not talking about physical mortality here. There is a sin unto death. There's a sin not unto death. Death meaning mortal, fatal, deadly, and that which is not unto death being not fatal, not mortal, not deadly, there is a sin that would ultimately see our spiritual demise, our eternal demise, our separation from God, so as to not have eternal life, which would be death. The opposite of life would be dead here, or death, separation from God. Isaiah 59 in verse number uh, one and two explains that our sins and iniquities are what separate us from God. Death being a separation of two things, sin can separate us from God, does separate us from God. There is sin that is unto death and sin not unto death. So what sin is it that is mortal? What sin is it that is deadly? What sin is it that is fatal to our spiritual life, to our eternal life? Well, again, let's take the text of Scripture. And what has been presented to us already, even by John? In 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 8 through 10, he actually tells us that sin is possible. We don't need to deny that we sin. We don't need to deny that we do things that are wrong or say things that are wrong or think things that are wrong. Because when we do that, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Or we make God a liar, and his word is not in us. Verse 8 and verse 10 of chapter 1. But notice in verse 9 where he's discussing the fact that we will sin, that we do sin. He says, if we confess our faults one to another, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. John presents the aspect that every sin that is confessed or repented of is a sin that God will forgive. Every sin for which we are willing to turn from, seek God's forgiveness, turn with an abhorrence toward that thought, that act, that word, whatever it may be, that is sinful, if we'll turn from that, we'll confess that sin, he is faithful and just to forgive. And John gives no exclusion there. Every sin that we are willing to confess, God is willing to forgive. So if that be the case, if every sin that we commit can be forgiven, then what would a sin unto death be? Wouldn't it follow that it would be a sin that was unrepented of? A sin that we were unwilling to confess a sin that we were unwilling to seek God's forgiveness for? So we, we understand that a sin unto death and a sin not unto death, the difference is whether or not we were, are willing to repent of it. If we hold in mind a disposition of unwillingness to repent, 
then God is not going to forgive us. God is not going to wipe away or blot out that sin. And so the sin unto death that will ultimately separate us from God eternally is the one that is unrepented of. So in this case, we see a brother that sins a sin. But that sin he is willing to repent of, then we need to pray for that brother and for his forgiveness and for his strength to overcome that and move on from that. However, if the brother is unwilling to repent, if he's unwilling to turn away from that sin, John says, I don't say pray for that. Why not? Because it wouldn't be of any benefit. It wouldn't be of any consequence. If a man is unwilling to repent of sin, there's no need to pray for forgiveness because forgiveness is not going to be granted. An individual has to be willing to repent of sin. And if he's not willing to repent of it, if he's not willing to turn from it, then he cannot be forgiven. And when we think about repentance, we're not just talking about time going by. We're not talking about people in their minds forgetting what was done. We're not talking about just stopping the activity. We, we're actually talking about asking forgiveness, acknowledging the wrong, and turning away from that wrong. A change of mind is, is absolutely imperative here. That's what technically repentance is about, a changing of the mind. But with the changing of the mind, there's going to be a changing of the direction, and there's going to be a seeking of forgiveness, confessing our sins, he is faithful then and just to forgive us our sins. So the sin unto death is a sin that is unrepented of, a sin that the brother who has committed it is unwilling to correct. And because he is unwilling to correct it, God is not going to forgive it. Thus, there's no need to pray for that. However, if a brother sins a sin and he is willing to repent of that sin, turn away from that sin, then we can pray for that. In James chapter 5, verse number 19 and 20, think about what James says here. When he says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him. The idea, he's gotten off course, he's erred from the, the truth, he's, he's gotten off path, and you convert him, you turn him around, you get him back on the straight and narrow, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Going to cover them over. Going to see them removed. Going to see them no longer held against him. Well, why? Because in verse number 16, he had said, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. So when there is confession of sin and then subsequently there is prayer, for forgiveness, then those sins are going to be forgiven. And the effectual fervent prayer of that righteous man avails much. And he uses Elijah as an example of effectual prayer, how he prayed in the first part that rain would not fall, and it didn't for three and a half years. <clears throat> and then he prayed again, and it fell. That's effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. And as it pertains to sin... When our brother sins and he confesses that sin and we pray for that brother, that prayer is going to be answered by God, that sin is going to be forgiven, and thus that brother is in place within the body of Christ, within the family of God, so as to know that he has eternal life. Christianity is a pathway it is a course that we pursue. That's why in Acts chapter 9, um, it, it speaks of Saul persecuting those that were of that way. It is a course to pursue. Unfortunately, sometimes a Christian practicing Christianity can get off the course, can fail to walk in the way. As John says in 1 John 1, 7, walk in the light. 
And, and of course, God's word, according to Psalm 119, verse 105, is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. So we're able to see how we're supposed to walk because of God's word. If we get out of that light, if we stray from the path, we need to be turned around. We need to be brought back to the way. And when we confess those sins, we repent of those sins, God will forgive. And John says, pray for those. Just like James in James chapter 5, verse number 16, then verse 19 and 20. So we have great confidence that God is going to hear our prayers. We know that God is going to, to uh, listen to his children when they petition him. And he will answer. We have that great confidence. As it pertains to the content of our prayer, we do need to be praying for forgiveness. We recognize sin is, is possible. Sin is, is committed. And when we repent of it, we need to be praying that God would forgive. We certainly need to include in our prayers a request for the forgiveness of sins, having that disposition, that mindset of a willingness to turn away. I think about a great example here in Acts chapter 8. Remember when Philip had gone down to Samaria, when there was great persecution in Jerusalem, he goes to Samaria and he begins to preach Jesus and the kingdom, preaches things concerning Jesus and the kingdom. And in so doing, there are those that believe both men and women. They're baptized and they're a part of the church. Well, the word reaches Jerusalem where the apostles are, one of those apostles being John, the other being Peter. So this very John who is telling us about praying as it pertains to sin being committed is in this example in Acts 8. So of those that heard Philip preaching of Jesus and things concerning the kingdom that responded correctly was Simon. Now Simon had been practicing sorcery in Samaria. And he had been bewitching people with it. He had been enriching himself by tricking the people through basically uh, magic, uh, sleight of hand. Uh, sorcery is what it's called. And, and he, he was able to make gain of the people because of that. Well, Simon saw the true miracles being done by Philip. And he also saw that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, that power to work real miracles was able to be done. And he offered them money in order to purchase that power to lay hands on people and impart those spiritual gifts. Peter tells him, thou art in the, the bond of iniquity, the gull of bitterness. That means you've sinned, Simon. You have trespassed. You've transgressed the will of God. And in so doing, you, you are in a place where you need to repent. You need to repent and pray if perhaps the thought of thine heart might be forgiven thee. You know what Simon said then? He urged Peter to pray for him that the things that he had spoken of would not come upon him. Simon understood that he had sinned. And because he had sinned, his eternal life was in jeopardy. His relationship with God was in peril. And so he needed Peter, and of course John was right there too, to pray for him that his sin would be forgiven so that the consequences of his sin, the punishment that he deserved, would not be levied against him. Now, that that Simon did was a sin not unto death. Why? Because Simon was willing to confess and repent. Simon was willing to change. He was willing to seek forgiveness from God, and thus Peter would pray for him. And so John, in what he's saying in verse 16 and 17, actually was part of an event that demonstrated the words that he was speaking here. A brother in Simon sinned a sin. Fortunately, in his case, it was a sin not unto death because it was a sin that was repented of and prayer was offered on his behalf. And that's exactly the kind of relationship that we as brethren should have. When we see a brother sin a sin, 
our reaction should be to convert him from the error of his way. Not to berate him, not to publicly ridicule him, but rather to, to convict him and convert him from the error of his way. To bring him back to the straight and narrow, so as to, to bring him to repentance, so that it is a sin not unto death that we can pray for him or her and that sin be forgiven. John presents that. And because God is willing to hear, we can have confidence that when we pray for forgiveness, God is going to answer that prayer. He's going to forgive. On the other side of that, it is possible that when a brother sins a sin, he's unwilling to repent of it. And John says, I do not say pray for that. Don't, don't address God on that behalf because God cannot forgive that man who is unwilling to repent. Now, one other note that we have here that we need to understand and address is what he says in verse 17, that all unrighteousness is sin. So when we ask the question about our brother sinning a sin, what did we see? Well, obviously it was something that was, was observable. It was something that could be seen. It was something that was uh, physical or it was something that was audible whether seen or whether it was heard, whether they did something or said something. You can't see their thoughts, so uh, that would be more difficult. But you see your brother sin a sin. How am I going to know it's sin? Because he says all unrighteousness is sin. So what is unrighteousness here as John talks about it? Well, of course, he's defining sin, but notice there is a prefix on this word, unrighteousness. U-N, unrighteousness, that U-N uh, prefix means that it is devoid of the quality of the thing it's connected to. Take the word, and we're going to talk about righteousness, but take the word unmerciful. If someone is described as unmerciful, that would mean they are devoid of that quality of mercy. If someone is unhappy, they are devoid of that characteristic or that quality of being happy. If someone is unrighteous, then they are devoid of that quality of righteous. So we have to ask the question, well, what is righteousness then? What, what does it mean to be righteous? Well, the term righteousness does mean equity. It does mean justification. A, it, it is a condition by which one can be acceptable unto God, or it's a condition acceptable to God. The word righteousness also carries the idea of integrity, of virtue, of purity of life, a correctness in thinking, feeling, and acting. To be righteous is to be correct in the way you act or the way you behave. To be righteous is to be correct in the way you think. To be righteous is to be pure in the matter of behavior. To be righteous is to be virtuous, a, a character uh, of virtue, moral correctness. And so... How do we define rightness of thinking, rightness of acting, rightness of, say, of speaking? Well, think about all the verses that would appeal or would, would actually uh, give us information about that. How do we think? Well, the Bible does talk about corrupt minds. The Bible does talk about inventors of evil things, like in Romans chapter 1. Um, uh, Genesis chapter 6 talks about the very imagination of man only evil continually. But in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, he actually talks about correct thinking. And he would say, things that are lovely, think on those things. Our thoughts should be composed of lovely things, uh, things that are true, things that are pure. Think on these things, things that are honest. So he tells us the kind of thoughts 
that should consume us, that, that should be in our mind. And I understand that it can be difficult to control the thoughts. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he talked about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. They're spiritual in nature. And they are spiritual in nature to the bringing down of every stronghold. But notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I believe it's around verse number 6, where he talks about the weapons that we have that are not carnal but mighty through God are able to bring every thought into captivity to Christ. Our thoughts need to be controlled by Christ. And the only way that our thoughts can be controlled by Christ is if his word dwells in us richly. So how can we be righteous? Well, we can dwell on God's word so as to shape or form our thoughts. Thinking on things that are good, things that are right, things that are honest, things that have virtue, things that are praiseworthy. We think on those things according to Philippians 4 and verse 8. What about our words? Well, you take a passage like he, he speaks of in, in Ephesians chapter uh, 6 or uh, rather uh, Colossians chapter 4. And he talks about our speech being always with grace and seasoned with salt. Be careful with your words. Uh, Jesus would talk about our words and letting our yea be yea and our nay be yea, uh, nay. Uh, Paul would talk about in, in Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. So what would be right communication? Well, be, it would be the speaking of truth, like Ephesians 4 and verse number 15, in love, the way that we speak the truth. Not only, not only the right thing being said, but it being said the right way with the right tone, the right inflection, the right connotation. Um, it would be not speaking of forked tongue. The man that speaks with, with a forked tongue or out of both sides of his mouth is an unstable man in, in, in all things, according to James uh, chapter 3. So we, we need to make sure our communication, the way that we talk, is, is righteous and unrighteous would be devoid of that, would be devoid of, of our speech if it was unrighteous, would be without grace. It would be unseasoned. Uh, it would be corrupt. It would be um, forked in our, our we'd be talking out of both sides of our mouth. It might be such that it was, it was communication that was perverse. And so, we need to make sure that our words are right. Any other thing, if, if you hear a brother speaking perversely, you hear a brother speaking unsalted language, uh, you hear a brother speak in a way that is uh, corrupt, well, that's a sin. And, and we, we communicate with our brother and we pray for him that that sin would be forgiven if he is willing to repent, turn from that. Unrighteous behavior. We, we have listings of activity that are improper, but we also have demonstrations of activity that is proper. We have a compassionate Savior who left us uh, footprints that we should follow in his steps. Uh, we have those lists of sins in Romans 1, uh, Galatians 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 11, uh, Revelation 21 and verse 8, several uh, uh, lists that, that present activity, actions on the part of man that are incorrupt. You take a passage like Galatians 5 where he says, the works of the flesh are manifest, they're made known, which are these? And he says uh, in verse 21, and such like, they uh, that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot follow in those things, do those things. So if you see a brother involved in those, that's a brother who has committed sin. And that sin needs to be repented of. And when it is, we pray for it. So now he says all unrighteousness is sin. We know what sin is. We can identify it because he has defined it in Scripture. Words, actions, even our thoughts can be corrupt or unrighteous. So all unrighteousness being sin, 
Anytime there is the perp uh, perpetration of unrighteousness, there needs to be repentance. Whether it's of thought, whether it's of word, whether it's of action or deed, it has to be repented of. And every sin that is repented of, God will forgive. It's a sin not unto death, but every sin that is unrepented of is a sin unto death that will see our spiritual demise, but also our eternal demise. So while all unrighteousness is sin, there is a sin not unto death. That is, it can be forgiven if we'll repent of that sin. So what do we have in these three verses? We have a great confidence. Uh, going back to verse number 13, we can know we have eternal life. When we know that we have eternal life, we know we're right with God because of that. And knowing that we're right with God, we know that our Heavenly Father hears us. He desires to hear. He wants to hear. And He will hear. And not only will He hear, he will answer our prayers. What a comforting thought to know that as we're going through this life, in both the good times and the bad times, God is willing to hear our petitions. We can offer him thanksgiving. We can make our requests known unto him. And we can with great confidence know that his ear is open to our prayers. And being open to our prayers, we know that he will answer. And he'll answer according to his will because he knows what is best. He knows what is good. And he will always do the right thing at the right time and in the right way. So we ask according to his will that all would be done according to his will. And as it pertains to sin, there will be times when we say the wrong thing. There will be times when we do the wrong thing. Sometimes even with good intention, we think we're striving, we want to do the right thing, we want to say the right thing, but maybe we don't. Well, understand that God is willing to hear your petition for forgiveness if you'll repent. And that ought to bring great comfort to us that we can pray one for another and have the forgiveness of God, knowing that with that forgiveness, we'll stand right with him and we can still know we have eternal life. There, there's, no, there's no reason to, to feel uh, as though we, we um, must live right in the sense that, that uh, well, I'll put it this way. In, in the past, even some of the comments that have been asked or others have asked the question of me, uh, you know, if, if it's the case that, that we're cleansed from sin, uh, why then do I feel like I'm not good enough? Well, you don't have to feel that way because you know that while you're, you may not be perfect, you have a Heavenly Father who is perfect and who will forgive when you ask for forgiveness. And thus, you can stand right with Him. And we have that confidence and that should produce joy within our life to know that we have eternal life and we have a Father who will help secure that eternal life by forgiving us when we seek forgiveness. That's all the time we have for this week, but that's a great thing to consider about that confidence we have in prayer. We've just got to utilize it. And we also have to have a disposition willing to seek God's forgiveness knowing that he will forgive. So we have our petitions of him. We know that God will answer prayer. And we also know that when we pray for forgiveness, as part of that prayer that he will answer, he will forgive. And that, my friends, should give us great joy in this life because we have a loving father who wants what is best for us. Next week, we'll finish out the chapter, means we'll finish out the book talking about things we know. The first thing we know from verse number 19 is going to be connected directly to what we were just talking about when we say we know that we must be active in our salvation. And when we're active in our salvation, we will know that we have eternal life and that God will hear our prayers. So until next week, may God bless us 
as we gain and grow in that confidence, knowing that we're right with him and that we have a father whose ears are open to our prayers.